So we finished with the death of Abraham last time, close up of Isaac's life now being transcribed by Jacob. Remember, you know, Jacob is transcribing Isaac's life. Isaac was transcribing Abraham's life, you know, the, uh, the various recorders of that history. Uh, early on we've seen Isaac's own personal tests of faith and the birth of his twins, Jacob and Esau. Uh, the majority of the chapter uh, compares the character and the activity of these two brothers. That's what we've been talking about last time. And it finishes up uh, as we see one brother, Esau, more or less just giving away his birthright to his brother Jacob for a uh, pot of stew. God had promised that it would go to Jacob, but, his, uh, but you notice Jacob's small faith moved him to manipulate in order to get it rather than to just wait on God. God had said this, the promise is going to go to you. Rebecca knew that from the beginning. You know? The younger son would be the one that would get the promise. And it's just another case of manipulation, you know, trying to get ahead of God, fixing the thing. So it shows you that small faith moves you to certain actions which many times you regret in the same way that great faith moves you to certain actions that cause us to, uh, to rejoice. Um, and we're all guilty of it. I mean, all of us have had this type of experience. That's one of the things I love about Genesis. You know, it's an ancient record of ancient peoples. And yet the stories, uh, the feelings, the relationships, the mistakes that the people make are so common. We see ourselves. In these, in these characters. I, I find that so uh, wonderful. Anyways, this manipulation will cause problems later on, and the next chapters deal with the continued striving with, with this family over the, um, over the blessing. Who's going to possess the blessing? Now, in chapter 26, verses 34 and 35, it says that Esau, to the sorrow of his parents, married two pagan women from the area. So this sets up the condition and the strife within the family as we enter into the story as it is being told in chapter 27. So let's read verses one to five. It says, Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son, and he said to him, Here am I, or here I am. Isaac said, Behold, now I am old and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke this uh, to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game, to, uh, went to, to the field rather, to hunt for game to bring home. So Isaac is getting older. He's not really near death at this point as he thought because he, he goes on to uh, uh, live to about 180 years old. He's about 135. So there are some days we feel like 135 and we're ready to go, right? But, uh, so he was, feeling, he was feeling old. He wasn't ready to die, he was feeling old. And it was the custom to pronounce the blessing at the time of a feast. And so since Isaac was to bless Esau, it seemed fitting that Esau should provide the feast himself. I'm going to bless you, you prepare the feast. Okay? Some interesting notes about this, very, this passage here concerning the blessing, if you kind of look between the lines. First of all, it was done in secret. He was doing it in secret. He didn't, he didn't bring the whole family together and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to offer, I'm going to you know, I'm going to confer the blessing. That, that was a big deal. No, 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 just between him, him and Esau. Rebecca, it says, only overheard. She wasn't included in this, she overheard it. So uh, it seems that this was not a popular thing that he was going to do. Right. Have you never seen your father say, look, this, you know, between me and you, don't tell your mother. <laughs> you know. So this is one of these deals. Then uh, Isaac's rebellion, yes, I said it again, Isaac's rebellion. Despite Esau's unholy behavior, he had married not one, but two pagan women. Despite God's promise to give the blessing to Jacob, 
which Isaac knew about. Despite Esau's oath to give the blessing to Jacob, despite all of these things, Isaac was determined to give the blessing to Esau anyways. So you add all that up and that, that adds up to rebellion. Number three, the physical blindness. It mentions that he was going blind, and we can understand that, you know, cataracts, things like that. Isaac's physical blindness, however, mirrored his spiritual blindness when it came to favoring this particular son. Again, such a human thing. You know, uh, how many families have we seen where the parents favor a particular child, and I, I hate to put it in these terms, who's just no good? You know, he or she's the devil's seed, you know what I mean? But the, that's the one that gets all the favors. So let's keep reading, verse 16, uh, uh, verse six rather, a long passage. It says, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, bring me some game and prepare a savory dish for me that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there that I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall bring it to your father that he may eat so that he may bless you before his death. Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, then I will be as a deceiver in his sight and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and his mother made savory foods such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And uh, she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. She also gave the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. So in this passage we see Rebecca, Isaac's wife, you know, she devises a plan where she would cook the food. Now right away you're thinking uh, it seems that Isaac's love for game food was not that great since he couldn't tell the difference between game and goat. You know? So uh, maybe he just favored the son. In addition, she plans to have Jacob serve it in disguise. Again, neither she nor Jacob, notice, are rebuked. God doesn't rebuke them for this. The plan was deceitful, but the purpose was right. Right? They were, doing, they were, doing the, they were trying to do the right thing, but they were doing it in the wrong way. Right? So God doesn't support deceit the trouble that they were allowed to suffer for this in the future shows that. But God lets us work our way through with our own methods if, if we insist on it instead of waiting patiently for Him. It's a little bit like, hey, knock yourself out. You know? If you just wait, I'm going to take care of this. You know? But if you want to go ahead and try to manipulate the situation, go ahead, you'll see what happens. And they found out what happens, we'll see the results of their, of their scheme a little later on. So Jacob is hesitant, but Rebekah convinces him that her food and a disguise of Esau's clothing with this particular smell and animal skins sewn to his collar and wrists you know, would be able to fool Isaac. So we see something about Rebekah here, very interesting. She's a forceful and decisive woman. She makes a plan, she convinces her son. She's even ready to take the blame if it all goes wrong. She says, don't worry about it, the curse will be on me. Now this, this could be for the love of her son, but her character so far suggests that she is a strong-willed believer. She's a kind of take charge kind of woman. Isaac seems to be a little more kind of laid back. You know, if you're looking at the two characters, you know, there's a messenger that goes out to find him a wife and bring him a wife, you know, and it says she comforted him after the death of his mother. You, know, you kind of get an idea of what kind of man he is. Her strength, Rebecca's strength, is her zeal for God and doing God's will, but her weakness is impatience. Impatience and self-will. And again, you know, how many people are like that? 
we want to do the right thing, we're going to do, you know, we're not afraid to go ahead, and a lot of times we're, we're trying to get to the right result, but we take all kinds of back roads in order to get there like this. So the story keeps on going, verse 18, it says, Then he came to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please sit and eat of my game that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come close that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he um, blessed him. And he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, whoops, wait, uh, let's go back here. Um, uh, See the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has uh, blessed. There we go. Verse 28 says, Now may God give you the dew of heaven uh, and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who blessed you. A long passage there. You know, one question arises from this passage. Why did God honor this blessing when it was received through deception and lies? Certainly not because God justifies or doesn't care about lies. Certainly not because the means justifies the, the end or the end justifies the means. You know, certainly that's not how we play. That's not, you know, that's not our God. Not you know, the end justifies the means. You know, that's not how we work. The answer is because God honors our will. For good or evil, He honors our will. He allows us to choose. That's why you know, a good goal was, was pursued in a wrong way. He allowed it to happen. God promised the blessing to Jacob, but his mother and Jacob went ahead of God, like Abraham and Sarah did. You know, the apple doesn't far too fall from the tree. And so they, they went ahead of God in order to work the thing out, and God permitted them to do it, but He also permitted them to suffer the consequences. See, that's free will. You get to choose, but you get to choose, you know, your choice will also determine the consequences that you will, that you will suffer afterwards. If you obey me, he says, you will live. If you disobey me, you will die. So the sins were definitely on Esau and Isaac's hands, one of them for being an ungodly man, Esau, he was an ungodly man, he was a sinner, and the other, Isaac, sin was on his hands as well because he refused to do God's will. I mean, it was blatant. God would have handled them and the blessing in his own way and time, but Jacob and Rebekah would not have sinned, if they would not have sinned or kind of rushed ahead. So this brings up another ethical problem, and, and that's the problem of the lesser of two evils. You know, sometimes we're in a situation where the options, well, our options are bad and worse. You know, like, you ever, hear, you ever been in a situation, you know, bad and worse. For example, a, a, a woman, you know, a, a pregnant woman is going to die. There's no doubt about it, she's going to die if she doesn't abort the child. And I'm not going to go into all the medical reasons for that, but we know that that happens from time to time in certain types of pregnancies. You know, a woman won't survive it. So it's the mother or it's the child. Is there a good choice there? No. It's bad or it's worse. Or people will be murdered if the one hiding them does not lie. Or, Ten people are deadly ill with a terrible disease, but there are only five vaccines available. You know, no, no good choices here. So the Bible also shows example of people who had to break you know, one of God's commands in order to obey another. For example, the Hebrew midwives who disobeyed civil authority, the king's edict was to kill the male children, well, they, they disobeyed that in order to save the Jewish babies. And of course, risking their own lives. So a bad, you know, one, bad and worse, bad 
kill, kill the kids, or not kill the kids, you know, and, or disobey the king and have ourselves killed. You know, no good choice here. Or Rahab, the harlot, lied to the army and jeopardized her family in order to protect the spies. So some would argue that Jacob and Rebekah lied and practiced deceit in order to preserve the promise and save it from going into the hands of, a, of an ungodly man, thus bringing condemnation and destruction on the family. But lying to save it was not, you know, not as bad as what could have happened. You know, a, ba a bad thing, you know, a bad thing is, well, you lie to save the blessing. Uh, a worse thing is the blessing goes to a guy like Esau. But in the end, whether one suffers in waiting for God to intervene, or one intervenes by choosing the lesser of two evils, the one thing that these situations bring about is the necessity for God's grace to save us in every situation. Okay? For those who wait, they wait for God's grace to save them. For those who make bad choices, they need God's grace to cover their sins in order to save them. It's always the same thing. A lie, even if done to save, is still a sin and it requires God's grace. You know, the woman, let's say, uh, the woman and her husband, they decide we're going to abort the child because I, uh, I, I, for whatever reason, you know, uh, we have other children, I can't let go of my wife, blah, 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 blah. But in the end, a living being is going to be killed on purpose. You know, there's no good, there's no right thing here. So a woman lets the child go in order to save her life. You know what she needs? She needs God's grace to forgive her and also to comfort her in having to make this impossible choice. Jacob and Rebekah needed God's grace to forgive their flawed plan even if it was done with good intentions. And because they were in a faith relationship with God, they received that grace. That's the difference. That's the difference. The point is, if you are in a faith relationship with God, you receive grace for sins. You receive grace for bad choices. You receive grace for decisions, you know, the lesser of two evil type decisions. You know? It's evil or it's even worse evil. So no matter what you choose, it's evil. Well, you need grace for that, to cover that. If you're not in a relationship with God, then you don't receive the grace. That's the terrible thing. Many non-believers are faced with the impossible choice, two evils. They have to choose one, and then they, they also recoup the, uh, you know, the consequences of those things. The difference with a Christian is, if you make the lesser of two evils, you're still with God's grace. I, I, I love that analogy of the, the woman with the child. There's no good choice there. That woman will need the grace of God to forgive her for having destroyed this child knowingly and willingly, but she also needs God's grace to comfort her because she lost her child. You know? So in the final verses of this section, Isaac gets to the heart of the matter by giving away the blessing. First, he blesses him for physical and worldly things, you know, prosperity and so on and so forth. And then the blessing of God regarding uh, superiority, protection, and the fact that he would be blessed by others and he would be a blessing to them. So despite the rebellion of Isaac, the worldliness of Esau, because Esau knew the blessing was promised to Jacob and that he had sold it to him himself, he was still ready to accept it. You know, Esau, this is not a good guy. This is not an honorable guy. He gave his word, he gave away the blessing. The minute his dad said, you know, I'm going to give you the blessing, he, what he should have said, well, dad, I'm sorry to say, I apologize, but I gave it away to Jacob. You know, one day I was hungry, he tricked me or something. No, 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 no. He just said, sure, let's bring it, bring it on, you know. So let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, verse 30 to 33, continue the story. It says, now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father, and he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, who are you? And he said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. 
Then Isaac trembled violently and said, who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate of all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. So Isaac and Esau learn of Jacob and Rebekah's you know, deceit. You know, it's interesting that Isaac confirms that Jacob, notice he says, he shall be blessed. I mean, he finally gives in to God at last when in trembling reality he sees that God has judged his rebellion through Jacob's deceit. It's that uh-oh moment, uh-oh, the light comes on. He's been had, he's been, you know what they say, what is it, gobsmacked? You know, it's like God reached down and psh, slapped him behind the head. Have you ever done something wrong? You knew it was wrong, but you kept doing it anyway? and then something happens to you to prove that you shouldn't have been doing this all along and you get caught, Ooh, that moment of, Ooh, I, knew that I, shouldn't have done, I knew this was going to happen. Well, that's what's happening to Isaac here. He loved Esau, he idolized his son's virility and he allowed it to blind him and go against what he knew was right. And so now God has shown him through this event what he knew all along, but he wouldn't give in to, that Jacob was God's choice. It's like it hit him all of a sudden. God always wanted me to do it. No matter what I did, God has worked it out in such a way that I've blessed Jacob. His trembling was a mixture of anger at his family, but also fear that God had, by this event, judged his rebellious heart. Terrific moment. So he's quick to see this and he becomes firm. That's why he says, and he shall have it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm through being rebellious. You know. Don't even argue with me. Uh, Jacob's going to keep the blessing. 34, oh, this is so painful to read this. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also, O oh my father. And he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times? He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. So Esau lifted up his voice and wept. He's begging. He's a grown man weeping and begging his father. 39, then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve, but it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. He's asking for a blessing, and what is Isaac giving him? He's giving him the bad news of what his future is going to be like. So Esau is sad because the political advantage of the blessing has slipped away from him. The elder will serve the younger, means their descendants will have this type of relationship. He begs for a blessing, since Jacob took it by deception, he figures it doesn't count. You know, the blessing you gave him, really? That doesn't count, that was just for show. So Isaac refuses and instead he gives a prophecy concerning Esau that he'll dwell in rocky places, be at war, have a brief time of respite. Interesting, as you study you know, further along in the Bible, Esau's descendants called the Edomites, the Edomites, bear this prophecy out. They lived in the hill country, they were constantly at war with Israel, and they were independent for a time until David's reign. But once David took control of the nation you know, as a king and unified the nation, uh, they became in subjection to David, and then ultimately they disappeared as a, as a people. So let's just keep going near the end. It says, so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. 
Now when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise, flee to Haran, to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother, notice she says, stay with him a few days until your brother's fury uh, subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides and he, will for, and he forgets what you did to him. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I bereaved of you uh, both in uh, one day? And it says, Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? So here we go, the deceit bears fruit, of course, as Esau's sadness turns into a, a murderous rage. What else was going to happen? You know, the guy's a hunter, he, instruments of death. So Rebekah decides to send Jacob to her relatives to live while Esau calms down, also to prevent him from marrying the pagan women like Esau did. But notice her character you know, shines forth. The thing blows up, but she has a plan. All right, here's what we're going to do. You're going to leave. You're going to go there. I'm going to call my brother. He's going to take care of you. You'll just be gone a few days. No, that, that's not how it worked out, right? But she's a, plan she's a planner, this woman. Of course, she's planning on Esau to kind of cool down, and we find out that eventually he does, but it'll be 20 years before Jacob returns and this will be the last time that Rebecca will see him. She will be dead before he comes back. So her favorite son, you know, she made a plan for him. She tried to save him and so in a sense lost him. All right, so next time we're going to talk about Jacob and his travels, continue with the story. You know, there's object lessons galore here in this episode. I've just, you know, you know how I do, a couple of, a couple of application lessons here. First one is, we need God's grace for everything. We think we need God's grace only when we do something wrong, but without His grace, we couldn't even exist. Grace is what brings us into being. Grace provides for all of our needs. Grace permits us to continue to exist despite the fact that we're imperfect in every single way. I don't know about you, but one of my prayers is, God, could I ever just do one thing that is just absolutely perfect and right no fly in the ointment, no, you know. And sometimes we do, right? Sometimes we, we say exactly the right thing at the right moment to the right person with the right intention, you know, and so it happens. And that's such a wonderful moment, isn't it? But boy, it doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. So from morning till night and all through the night, we need God's grace to sustain us when we do wrong. And when we do right, but we do it even imperfectly. So one lesson that we see from these people, all of them, from the dad to the mom to the son, they need God's grace in every way as we do. Lesson number two, blind love is not true love. Esau is a good example of those children who are talented and charismatic. They're raised in Christian homes with love and stability, but they love the world, they reject or ignore all the good influence that is around them. And we know children like this, right? Parents sometimes make Isaac's mistake of ignoring all the signs of fallen faith and try to love their children into heaven. You can't do that. You can't love them into heaven. One thing that we see in the record here, nowhere in the record of, Esau, of Isaac and his dealings with Esau, Nowhere in the record does Isaac rebuke, admonish, or discipline Esau. You don't see it anywhere. You don't see it anywhere. On the contrary, he encourages him in his ways. So blind love is not true love. True love takes the good and the bad for what it is and deals with both the good and the bad in an appropriate, in an appropriate manner. You know, in other words, you know, true love uh, 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 lifts up and encourages and, 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 and reinforces the good, and true love also calls out the bad. I love this about you and so on, so on, and so forth, but this here, this is wrong. This is what you're doing here, this is wrong. I remember when our 
kids were a small example. I always use smoking because it's such a, a universal thing, you know, because all of us, many of us have had to deal with tobacco in our lives. And I used to say to Paul, because you know, he was always the one who wanted to experiment with everything, and I'd say, all I'm telling you is this. You, 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 can, you can smoke behind my back. You know, it would be the easiest thing for you in the world to, to go behind me or you know, you're outside of the house. I'm not watching you 24 seven. But I just want you to realize one thing. Every time you smoke, you're disobeying me. I don't care if you're 50 miles away or 5,000 miles away. Every time you pull out a cigarette and you light up, you are disobeying me because I have commanded you, I'm, as your father, do not do this. This is destructive, this is not good for your health, blah, 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 all the things we all know. And that stayed with him his whole life. And yeah, did he disobey me? Sure he did, you know, sure. You know, guys go, young guys go out, they go in the military, they try all kinds of stuff. But he's come back and said, I remember, I, every time, I knew every time <laughs> I wasn't doing the right thing. You know? I'm just using that as an example. You know? uh, uh, we have to build up our children and, and really tell them, you know, I, I appreciate this about you, or you're, you know, I love this quality about you, but we must also not be afraid to say, but this thing over here, this is not a good thing. You're going to have to work on that. I'm going to pray for you and whatever. You, know? you, can't, you can't love the sins away. You have to rebuke the sin. You have to admonish the sinner. And then the third, uh, the third lesson, of course, come on, there we go. Uh, there's always a price to pay. I mean, that's pretty obvious here. Always a price. Isaac lost both sons and he lost the confidence of his wife for his rebellion. Rebecca lost sight of her beloved Jacob and, and the peace that she had in her home. Esau lost the blessing, he lost the respect of his parents, the fellowship of his brother, and Jacob lost the entire family. So everybody was a loser at the end. Jacob for his deception, Esau for his worldliness, uh, 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 Re uh, Rebecca for her manipulation, Isaac for his rebellion. You know, everybody's a loser because everybody, of course, was disobeying God. So even if no one knows, even if you think it'll result in good, there's always a price to pay for sin. And I'm looking here, and we're pretty much experienced Christians here. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly preaching to the choir. So, all right. So next week we'll just keep on going with uh, Jacob's great adventures with uh, Laban and finding a wife and so on and so forth.